Okay, here goes. Let's see if this works. That's a lot of air. Where's that coming? Oh, I guess I need to bolt the steam chest cover on. Details, details. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondiax. Back on the steam engine today, and we're going to finish up the valve gear. This is really cool because we're going to get to see the piston operate entirely timed with all of the valve gear off of the crankshaft. The last piece we need is this little linkage here, this flexible linkage that is going to connect everything together. This entire assembly is smaller than my thumbnail, which is why you can't really see it. This is really the challenge of this project is the size of everything. So we're going to have to have lots of creative work holding and we're going to learn a few things about making really small parts. Okay, let's go. Here's what we're making. It's kind of a hinge that goes into the middle of the valve gear and it's made from a male and female clevis. Kit comes with this little piece of brass square bar. We already took the cross nut out of that, you may recall. So I'm gonna square it up and I'm going to set up to make the two halves of the little clevis out of this. Then I pull it out of there, deburr it, flip it around and do the same thing on the other end. What I'm doing here is I'm going to make one half of the clevis on each end of this bar. Because the parts are so small, there's going to be no way to hold them in any of the machines. So by making one on each end, I can keep the long stock in the middle to hold them both without wasting any stock. Now leaving this end in place, I can edge find the end and I'm going to edge find the center axis there. And now I can center drill for the hole through the clevis. And uh, this is a very, very tiny hole, as you can see. Got the mill cranked all the way up to get hopefully enough speed for this tiny, tiny drill. And since the two parts are very symmetrical, what I can do now is set up an end stop right there, and then I can just flip the part end for end, and I can do the same operation on the other end and not have to measure or re-edge find anything. Now I'm going to stand the part on end and I'm going to cut the slot. So we're making the female end of the clevis first. And so I need it vertically in the vise so that I can mill on the Y axis so it won't tend to slide in the vise. And I'm going to square it up just by using two sets of parallels here because there isn't really enough stock exposed there to indicate on. So just uh, pinching it between the parallels will get it close enough for this. And I can double check there with a square, make sure that we're visually squared up. I can't see any light through there. Then I use the edge finder to find the center line here on the x-axis because that's where our slot needs to go. And the slot calls for a width of 330 seconds, which I happen to have a weird specialized end mill exactly that size because this project required me to buy one earlier for the steam ports, as you may recall way back in the cylinder machining episode. This is a straightforward operation of just milling my way straight down to depth. The drawing calls for a square bottomed hole, which is why I'm milling it vertically, not horizontally. It's a little tricky to deburr, but if I'm careful, I can get in there. Flipping it around for the male end. Now we're doing the same operation, just milling away the sides to create a tab. Tab A for slot B, as the kids used to say. Now I'm going to deburr this so I can measure it. Dimensionally, I have a lot less control over the female end because the end mill is going to cut what it cuts and I can't really do a lot about that. This end though, it's easy to control the thickness. So I'm going to leave this end about a thou large and then I'll hand fit them together with a file to guarantee that I get a really nice fit. It's likely that the end mill cut the slot a little bit oversized and it's hard to say. It's such a small slot, it's also hard for me to measure with the tools I have. So I can just fit one to the other here later on. And there we have most of two clevises, clevi on either side of this piece of stock. We're going to round off the end soon, but it's going to get hard to measure the length after that. So I'm going to measure the length now just by bluing it up and scribing a line on there and do that at both ends. And I know how long the final part will be. And then I'm going to take it over to the vise and I'm going to radius the ends with a file. Now, there are a lot of ways to radius the ends of a part. You can do it in the mill vise by putting a pin through it and then you clamp it at different angles and mill the top flat at the same height, work your way around, you have a radius. Or you could get crazy and set it up on the rotary table, or I also considered making filing buttons to do this, but the problem is these parts are just so small that all of those options are either prohibitively difficult to set up 
or just not worth it because the parts are so small. So it's really not that difficult to hand file a decent radius, especially in brass. So that's what I did. It gives it that little bit of eh, artisan flair. It's not toolmaker precise, but I think it looks nice. And again, the camera work here is all in close, so it's hard to conceive of how small these parts really are. I've done all I can with the parts connected to the stock now, so it's time to separate them. And I'm just using a hacksaw to cut them proud of my length line there, and then I'll mill them down to final size. This only takes a second because it's brass. With the pieces separated for the first time, we can finally do our first test fit and see how we did with tab A and slot B. And as expected, they don't fit, which is good because that was expected. Now I can set up the tab in the vise and I'm just going to take a couple of different files and I'm just going to very gently massage that surface down a little bit until I get a good fit. It really doesn't take much. I only left it a thou or two large and then we have a very nice fit. So it always pays to think about how the parts are going to fit together and make the part first that you're going to have more difficulty hitting a dimension on, which is usually an interior part, you know, an interior bore or an interior slot, things like that. Those are more difficult to get dimensionally correct than anything exterior. So make the tabs and the pistons and things second so you can fit them to the slots and the bores of the world. You know, sometimes you get a part like this that really requires specialized equipment to measure very well, and you don't tend to have a lot of specialized metrology equipment in a hobby shop, so you can get away with a lot just fitting one part to another, because you're only making one of them typically in a hobby shop. Now, as teeny tiny as these parts are, they are at least square, so they're relatively easy to hold in the vise. And they're relatively straightforward to square up as well using this parallel squishing technique, which uh, I actually just sort of thought of for this part, and it's working really well, so I might do it for more parts. It's not, you know, incredibly precise, but for something like this, it's certainly sufficient. You'd still want to indicate vertically if the part was uh, critical that it be vertical. With the bottom taken care of, I need to get a threaded hole centered on there. So I'm going to edge find on the X, but on the Y, we still have the center line that we had before when we first set up this stock, and nothing's changed. So we can just use that and center drill our teeny tiny little hole there. To get the depth just right, I gently set the drill down on the surface and then zero the quill DRO. The drawing calls for the drill cone to just break through the other side of each clevis. So that's a, a relatively precise depth. In with the tap now and some WD-40. This is a small thread, but not the smallest one on the project. And this is brass, which taps very easily, so no trouble here. I'm going in with the taper tap and then the bottoming tap because this is a, a very shallow hole and we need as many threads as we can get in there. So here's the valve control rod and I'll thread that in there to make sure it fits and it does, so we're good to go. Next up, the drawing calls for a very tricky feature. It, there's supposed to be a gentle taper on the bottom of each clevis section. So I need to set it up in the lathe, and these parts are too small to hold in my forejaw. The jaws won't close up that far. So I tried setting it up with some copper packing chunks here. You might recognize these from the previous video where I used them to hold the eccentric hub. And this kind of almost worked, but it wasn't very stable, and I don't think I was going to have any hope of getting the part dialed in or straight doing this. So I, uh, I gave it a shot, but this was not going to work, so I gave up on that. So after a lot of futzing around and thinking and piddling around in the junk bin, I found this split block that I'd made for something else, and I found that it was actually a perfect fit for a tight grip on the corners of these brass parts. And the block itself is aluminum, so it's not going to hurt the part. And that held the part really securely, so it was pretty easy then to set that up in the fore jaw. And then I just threaded in the valve rod and used that to dial in the part concentric. We'll see how that's running, and that's pretty good. Again, this is just an aesthetic detail, but I want it to look as nice as possible. So now I can just come in with my chamfer tool and put whatever chamfer looks good. There's no dimension on this per se, but I like how that looks. So now I can just swap out for the other one, and I'm just basically chamfering this to look the same by eye, just, you know, doing a little bit at a time till it looks about the same. And there's our two completed little clevises. So now I can do a little test fit and see how it goes. Now the pin there is actually supplied in the kit, so let's see if that fits. And survey says, eh, that fits a little too well. It's pretty loose in there. I don't really like that. 
So I did some study on this to see what happened here. Why is it so loose? Because the pin will actually just fall out under its own weight, which I don't think is quite right. The problem is that the drawing specified for a 63 thou hole. So I didn't think that through very much. I just grabbed a 63 thou drill, drilled the hole, Bob's your uncle. Well, Bob is not my uncle because what I should have done is realized that what they mean is 62.5 thou. The drawing is rounding to three decimal places and 62.5 is 1 16th. So what I should have done is drilled that a little undersize and reamed it to 1 16th. By drilling it with a 63 thou drill, I ended up a little bit oversized and this pin is actually a little bit undersized. It's actually 61 thou. So what all of that added up means I've got about a five thou clearance on this hole. So it's very sloppy. I'm not happy about that. So what I'm gonna do is make my own pin. I've got a piece of 01 tool steel drill rod here. I'm gonna turn it all the way down to that teeny tiny pin. I'm gonna make it a little oversized to fit my slightly oversized hole. Now turning something this small is a little tricky, but here's a way that you can do it. I'm turning about half the length of the pin to a few thou oversize, and then I come back in and I turn the second half of the pin. And by doing it this way, you have most of the material always supported. If you tried to do this whole pin in one go, it would be much too thin and you wouldn't have enough rigidity for the machining forces. So by doing it in sections like this, working your way back, you can get a very long, thin part. And then you leave each section a couple thou large and then come back in and do a very light finishing pass down the whole thing to get one consistent diameter on dimension. And then I just polish that up for a nice finish. And that should be a good fit in there. Let's see how it goes on the clevis. Yeah, that's much better. So I'm much happier with that. It's still a slip fit, but it's not all loose and sloppy and nobody likes loose and sloppy tabs and slots. Rather than trying to part this off, I've got a dustpan down there to catch the part and protect the ways from the saw in case I slip. And I just hacksawed that right off of there. And then I'm just using the Dremel sanding drum to sand it down to final length. Okay, test fit number two. Assemble the clevis and drop in my little newly homemade pin. Let's see how that goes. So that's a much better fit now. It slides in there, but I think it'll stay there. Now for final assembly, what I'll do is I'll Loctite one end of it into the outer clevis arm there just so that it stays in place. There's nothing really retaining it in there. With that, we finally have enough parts to fully assemble the valve gear and watch it run. I'm very excited about this. Trust me, this is my excited voice. You saw me assemble the eccentric hub and clamp last time, so this is just a repeat. I needed to put all these parts back together again, making sure they still work. Everything looks good, so I can install that on the crankshaft. Now we need one last little piece. There's a connecting rod that goes between the clevis that we just made and the eccentric hub there. Now I put threads on it off camera because that wasn't very exciting and I've done that many times before. So that's all working well. However, we'll put the clevis on here and well, look at that. Now the valve control rod needs to go from there to there. So how do we do that? Well, we're gonna bend it. The drawing has a bending diagram here. I'm gonna start by annealing the brass at the bending locations just to make sure that it doesn't crack because brass will certainly do that. So I heat up that area to just a dull red and then I bend it just by eye until it matches the diagram and then I can mark the second bend and do the same thing there. I'm using copper to protect the brass from the jaws of my pliers there. And once I've got something that looks about right based on the drawing there, seems like a pretty good fit. Now I can take it over to the engine and see how it fits on there. Now the key here is that the clevis should just drop right into place. You don't want the bar to be applying any kind of lateral spring loads on that clevis or it's gonna cause it to bind up and it'll still run, but it'll use more energy to, to run that valve gear. So I want that valve to just fall right into place. So after a little more adjusting, you can see how now it just drops right on there as though it was meant to live there, which is what I want. Okay, reassemble it and let's give it a whirl. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. That's steam engine valve gear. It's running. It's doing, it's, it's valving. Okay, quick cleaning with the scotch bright there to clean up the torch marks and so on on the brass, make it all look nice and shiny. Now let's bring up some compressed air and watch this valve do its thing. Look at that. In response to crankshaft turning, piston goes in and out. That is fantastic. Listen to that sound. 
it's kind of steam engineing. It's running on between 3 and 4 PSI here. Now, I'm really happy with that, but it's not necessarily a, a proof that the engine is going to run on 3 or 4 PSI, because the engine isn't actually driving all of the mechanisms yet. Any friction that's in the crankshaft and so on is being taken up by my hands. But this is pretty fantastic. This is the first kind of signs of life that I've seen from the engine, and I'm really, really excited about it. Can't you tell from my excited voice? I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like what I'm doing, throw me some love on Patreon. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.